because I had it there and now uh, it went away. And I hit Alt R, presumably we're recording, although I'm not it seeing a record. Oh yeah, I see the recording button now, so I'm good to go. All right, hello everyone and welcome again to uh, the, the second presentation for session one, SUAS operations over active eruptions in Hawaii. Um, part one, introduction to SUAS. And here we go. So um, I'm coming to you from Hawaii. Uh, lots of folks uh, who have participated and uh, helped to, to fund and collaborate on our work um, from all over, National Science Foundation, um, Columbia University, lots of different folks to acknowledge for some of their their effort and support. Um, so this is a photo of, of, uh, of me there with the, the hat on and uh, parts of a uh, research team. Um, so Nick Turner and Nathan Stevenson uh, holding uh, the little swinglet cam, uh, which is a, a drone that we used in the past. And then Inet Lev in the middle there from Columbia and Heather Kimball. Um, so I am uh, here in Hawaii. Um, I am not a volcanologist. I'm a physical geographer who does work in remote sensing. And I did my uh, uh, graduate work at University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, Department of Geography there. Uh, and I did my dissertation work looking at um, uh, hill slope geomorphology changes in the Channel Islands uh, off of the coast of, of California. Um, I've also done a little bit of work in aerospace. I worked for a satellite separation system for a while. This is the Starshine 3 satellite, and uh, that was very interesting. So I've always been interested in space and remote sensing. And since I've come to Hawaii, uh, more and more interested in these small unoccupied aerial uh, systems, uh, just because of what they allow us to do in terms of data acquisition. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm here in Hawaii. I'm luckily enough uh, based on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, which is highlighted here. Um, the youngest island uh, in the chain, although there's one offshore that hasn't broken through the ocean yet. And I'm located here in eastern Hawaii um, in the town of Hilo. And this is a shot of the, the roofs of my university. So it's a, it's a nice place. Hopefully uh, you all can come visit at some point. Um, nice campus, a uh, lot of good opportunities for all kinds of different um, uh, topics. Again, I'm in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science. Uh, we do a lot of field work. Um, we're also affiliated with uh, a master's program, Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science. Uh, there's not a PhD program here at UH Hilo except in Hawaiian languages. It's the only one in the, in the world. I'm also the director of the uh, Spatial Data Analysis and Visualization Lab. Um, this is a, uh, a lab and our mission is to apply geospatial tools to environmental problems of local significance and to disseminate geospatial tools and knowledge to the larger island community. And for us, that's generally Hawaii and then the greater Pacific Islands, so the Marshall Islands and Chuuk and places like this. Um, but happy to have a more international um, audience as well. So we work on all kinds of different things. So certainly uh, volcanic eruptions when they occur, and that's what I'll be uh, focused on today. But we also look at you know, shoreline change because of erosion and sea level rise. Um, again, some work doing agroforestry out in the Marshall Islands, uh, uh, forest pathogens. Um, these are invasive deer that we have here in Hawaii. So we work on a lot of different things. I'm a geographer. I like to map things. Um, but again, today, what we're focusing on is, is, is this kind of thing, right? So the idea of uh, active volcanic eruptions and what we can uh, learn from uh, this tool, this technology, S uh, UAS, and how they can help us not only respond in the emergency response, um, but also um, scientifically the data that we can uh, gain from these and, uh, and help further our, our understanding. So um, I've mentioned a little bit about where I'm located, um, but I, I want to see where you guys are located. We did this in the chat a little bit, but I think it, it might be interesting to try to visualize this. So um, I haven't 
enable these tools yet. I will in just a second. So I'm going to give you like two slides that should explain how to do the annotation. Some of you are maybe very familiar with this already. Um, but uh, I'd like basically to see you guys put little stamps uh, on this map and we can see where everybody is. And the tools aren't enabled yet. So I'm going to show you two slides explaining what you'll see and then I'll enable it so you'll actually see that. So if you go up to the top, once I enable this and go over to view options, eventually you'll see this annotation um, option. It shouldn't be there yet, but it'll be there in just a second. And then once you get on that annotation option, if you go to stamp, and then if you choose either the check mark or the um, X, and then use that to put your location on the globe, I think that'd be quite, quite interesting. So that's what I'd like to have happen here. So I'm going to uh, allow you guys to annotate. So now you should be able to, uh, again, scroll up to the top under view options and then choose annotate and then go to stamp and then, ah, there you go. All right. And choose either the check or the X. If you want to do the heart, that's fine. But I thought if there are too many hearts or solid things, we'd have a hard time finding stuff. So then I'm going to um, annotate myself if I can. All right, we got some wild arrows coming too. So um, excellent. So this is an interesting way to see the distribution. So lots of folks in uh, South America, Europe, India, um, but all over really. So great. I'm going to leave this on a little bit. And again, this is quite interesting because the original uh, summer school was going to be an in-person summer school here at my campus uh, uh, for four days of intensive in-person training. And we were probably only going to get, you know, 10 or 20 people maybe. Um, and so the idea that we can reach so many additional folks from all across the world is, uh, is really exciting. So uh, it's one of the benefits of this, you know, terrible time that we're under right now. Um, so great. That looks great. Thank you for uh, participating in that. If you hadn't had a chance to annotate, we may have some other annotations down the line. And, and don't worry if it didn't quite work for you. It's not that big a deal. We've got some folks down in Antarctica, looks like. Um, all right. So I'm going to disable your ability to annotate. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance. And let's see here. I'm going to clear all the clear all the annotations. Okay, great. So let me just double check. No, we're looking good. If I can advance. Okay, so now we're going to get into uh, some of the the meat of the presentation, and um, this is a new variant on the acronym for me, uh, small unoccupied aircraft systems. In the past, I've called these small unmanned aircraft systems, but we're trying to degender things. Um, and you, people also use the term drone uh, fairly uh, commonly. And so that's, that's fine too. Um, but SUAS um, is, and there's also remotely piloted aircraft. There's a whole number of different um, acronyms, but um, SUAS will, will suffice for uh, today's presentation. And to kind of help hammer home uh, some of the value of this, which I'm sure you all are already well aware of, uh, this is a, a portion of a Landsat 8 image, uh, 30 meter pixels. I might ask you, what do you think this land cover is? It's green, so perhaps you might think that it's some kind of vegetation. Uh, this is the same exact area, but this is now uh, sub-meter digital globe imagery um, uh, downloaded from Google Earth. And um, just curious uh, if you want to type in the chat uh, what folks think this might be. Forest. All right, here in some forests. So if you look at this, um, it looks like there's a brown and then a green strip and then a brown strip and then a green strip. And um, typically 
And again, it's really hard to see. It's just a zoom in and it's blocky and it's hard to kind of see. But this is actually an agricultural setting. Um, and again, it, but it's hard to see. I'm seeing solidified lava flow. It's really hard to see this kind of a thing. Um, what about now? So this is the same. Um, it's not. It's a. It's a subset of this area. But but does anybody know what kind of plant that is? Yes. Yes. I'm seeing it. Banana. Right. So banana plants. So so this is from a banana plantation on East Hawaii Island, and this was acquired with a small. Um, unmanned aerial occupied system. And you can just get an incredible amount of detail, right? And so that's one of the benefits of these systems is the spatial resolution that you're able to get. That's, that, that's, that's one. Um, this is a uh, sort of a, a, a diagram or visualization I put together, um, sort of comparing the different scales in terms of spatial visual res res resolution, excuse me, for different types of satellites, um, field data, right? So if you do plot data, um, you can measure, you know, tiny little areas. You can get out your your ruler or such. Um, and then we've got um, uh, manned aviation or airborne uh, remote sensing, and then uh, distinction between fixed wing and rotary wing um, on unoccupied aerial systems. There are also now. Uh, uh, vertical takeoff and land hybrid systems. I'll talk about that briefly, um, but these are kind of the main systems. So in spatial resolution with the UAS, you can get down to centimeter uh, scale. Um, now, if you don't care about centimeter scale, that's just overkill. But there are some questions where that's quite for, you know, crack mapping and other things during eruptions, that can be important information. Cost. So manned aviation or um, uh, these types of flights with, with flight crews and, and fuel costs and, and uh, 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 airplane upkeep, uh, expensive. Um, commercial satellite imagery can be quite expensive, although there's big changes happening in that world right now. Um, on the other hand, free, right? So there are freely available satellite images and that's fantastic. Um, field work can be quite expensive. Um, it kind of depends where you are in the world, uh, but your uh, your coverage uh, is 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 also a part of this. The temporal resolution with uh, these unoccupied aerial systems, you can fly every hour if you want to. Where you can't really do that with uh, manned aviation and satellites have you know day to week, um, and depending on where it is in the, in the orbit. Um, and then again, the temporal resolution for field work, it can, it, can, it can span. So where the UAS systems, maybe one of their big weaknesses is, are, at least for these smaller ones, is terms of the spatial coverage, right? So satellite imagery cover the globe. Um, uh, manned aviation platforms uh, can fly uh, uh, long distances and cover quite, quite large areas. Um, field work. Uh, very small little areas. And so these SUAS are a bridge, uh, I see. They, they, they provide information to complement and supplement other types of remotely sensed imagery. Um, and they do that very well. And their uh, capabilities, uh, both technologically and, and um, legislatively, as these different countries sort of come on with different rules, are expanding. And particular um, beyond visual line of sight flying will allow us to cover uh, very large areas. And so this is sort of an exciting uh, time that we're getting into right now. Um, this is a uh, this is a slide from uh, New Zealand. I gave a presentation in New Zealand a few summers ago, kind of a similar workshop. And uh, this is a, a picture of the Hamilton uh, Model Aero Club. And so this is just a, a question. What is the difference between this sort of traditional radio controlled aircraft kind of flying and a SUAS or drone? What's the, what's the major difference for these ones? And again, if you wanna write something in the chat there. Okay, I'm seeing payload. Uh, so for sure you can put, but you know, this big red one there, that can, that can carry some sizable payload. Camera, mission, use, the range, signal type. Um, again, some of these um, remotely uh, uh, or radio controlled aircraft for club use, they're, they're quite sophisticated. Yeah, 
autonomy. So autonomy and intelligence. Um, so the, the main one is if the traditional RC aircraft, they, you have to have a, a, a human pilot involved. If you don't, it's going to crash. Um, whereas these SUAs are capable of autonomous flight. And so you can, you can upload a mission, uh, preload a mission, basically hit the button to go and it will conduct the entire uh, flight and land all by itself. And you are just there in, in case, in, in best case scenario. So, so that's a main, 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 main difference. And this acronym, Small Unoccupied Aerial Systems, it truly is a system. A lot of people are focused on the, the platform itself. And, and this is my assistant, Timo, uh, setting up uh, uh, SUAS. This is Inspire 2 during the 2018 Kilauea eruption. And uh, people often focus just on that, you know, sexy looking uh, instrument. Um, but the truth is, it is part of a much broader system and you need all of those pieces to be in line and working for you to successfully carry out your mission. So the platforms, the major components of the platforms, uh, the GPS constellation, power, ground station, the payload, the sensors, and then having a trained um, licensed, if that is required in your area, and competent flight crew. And in some cases, that might just be one person, depending on the mission. In other cases, that might be you know, four or five people, uh, depending on safety considerations and other things that are going on. So to successfully conduct and carry out SUAS flight operations, you need to have sort of a systems uh, view of, of, of things. And focusing on the platforms first, there's, uh, again, kind of two main divisions. There's the fixed wing airframe and then the uh, multi-rotor. Um, and just a quick comparison, the fixed wing, uh, typically they need to maintain relatively high speeds uh, to stay aloft. Uh, because they are more aerodynamic, they often have much longer, longer flight times. Uh, we have, and I'll show this later, uh, SenseFly EVX, and it can fly for 90 minutes. That's, that's, that's pretty good. So 90 minutes, that's uh, not insignificant. There are other platforms that clearly can fly for days, um, but simple. So if you have a malfunction, they can glide. Uh, but they're, the main uh, issue for these ones is they're harder to fly. They don't have hover capability. And the big one is landing. You need an open area to land. And if you are working in the jungle, like we often are here in Hawaii, or in very rocky uh, terrain, um, finding an open, beautiful, grassy field to land in, <laughs> that can be very, very challenging. And so the, the, the copters are uh, often what we end up, up using. Uh, they usually have much shorter flight times. Uh, they're more complicated, but they can vertical takeoff and landing and hover. They are also more hazardous. So those props um, can cause damage. And if there is a malfunction, they'll just sort of drop out of the sky as opposed to a nice a nice glide. Uh, this is just some imagery of some of the uh, uh, platforms we've used over the years. Um, so this is the Inspire 1, uh, the Inspire 2. And so a reason for showing you some of this information, and, and I've, we have other um, companies' equipment, and when I show, I'm making this point here, when I show equipment here, it's not an endorsement. I'm not saying buy this. I'm not associated with any of these companies. I'm just sharing information. These are some of the, the, the groups that we, that we use. And I'll talk about hybrids in just a little bit. Um, the, the costs can range from, and these little small guys, you know, about $1,000 or less, up to if you add all of the cameras and everything else in, many tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so that can be a barrier. Um, but some of these, these smaller ones, the cost is, 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 is not that. Um, and, and, the, and the Inspire 1, I think, is, is now you can't get anymore. The Inspire 2, I think, is something around 3,000 US. Um, stepping on up uh, into the Matrice 200. And again, there's the cost of the platform itself. But then there's also all of the peripherals. So to operate this, you need an iPad, you need SD cards, you need a laptop to be the ground station, you need the different types of cameras, you need a carrying case, and you need batteries. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
Uh, just recently now coming out is the DJI Matrice 300 RTK. And this thing can fly almost an hour without a payload. So the, the flight times are expanding. They're getting um, longer and the abilities and the sensors are, are getting better and, 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 and improving. Um, this, I, I don't exactly know the cost of, 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 this, of this one, um, but the, the purpose of sharing this with you is, again, this idea that this is a very fast moving on the commercial side um, industry. And every year there are new uh, platforms with and new battery types and new things coming out. Uh, stepping on yep, even larger, this is the Matrice 600. Uh, so we use this for some different things here in Hawaii. Um, but logistically, this is becoming an issue because it's a very relatively large um, piece of equipment. You start to need a larger vehicle um, and transporting it. You don't want to hike this thing back into the jungle. Um, so, so as you get bigger, the capability increases, but the logistical challenges also um, increase. And then on the other side, you know, these smaller ones that can fit in your hand. Very easy to just put in a backpack and, you know, hike 10 miles in, uh, 15 kilometers into the jungle, pop it up, uh, survey what you're interested in, and you're good to go. And you could never do that with this larger uh, DJ Matrice 600. So just some things to, uh, to, to consider. Um, I'm getting some questions about cameras. I'll be talking about cameras a, a little bit later. Uh, this is a, a fixed wing um, from uh, Swift Radio Planes. They're a, a US company. Uh, this thing's got about three hours of flight time. So three hours of flight time is, 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 is quite good. They also have a VTOL version. Um, I think it can fly for about two hours, but then you get the benefit of the vertical takeoff and landing. Um, so again, this is a, an exciting, exciting time. Um, and this is Wing, Wingtra. Uh, this is a, another company that uh, does vertical uh, takeoff and, and landing. And as I said before, you know, every year there are new and better, more capable and more expensive SUAS platforms and sensors that are coming out. And so if you're interested to get into this, uh, if you're not already involved in doing this kind of mapping and such, it's an interesting question about, you know, when you take that, that, that committing jump to buy a bunch of equipment, because it, it, it can be an investment. And in two years time, you know, that stuff may not be obsolete, but there will certainly be something uh, quite a bit, quite a bit better. So, um, it's an interesting, interesting thing to, 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 to think about. The, the major components of the SUAS, a lot of it has been driven by, you know, smartphone and smartphone technology. So if you think about what's in your smartphone in terms of the GPS and the gyroscope and the accelerometers and things, a lot of those are the same thing that, that are needed for a, a, a well-functioning SUAS. So, the development of the SUS industry, I don't want to spend too much time on the, the, the past or whatnot, but there's sort of three um, sort of streams that have come together. Um, one is the military. So there's, uh, you know, been the use of unoccupied aerial systems by militaries around the world for quite some time. And there's been a fair amount of R&D that's gone into that. Um, the model aircraft community, um, which is uh, in the past a lot of gas powered airplanes and there's been a lot of work for uh, radio control frequencies and, and a lot of things figured out for that. And then, you know, new tech and the sort of um, uh, smartphone industry. And so these three things have come together and really the, the, the smartphones in recent time to uh, produce, you know, cons consumer grade uh, SUS, which are incredibly robust now and very useful instruments for uh, scientific um, uh, data collection. And so it's been a, a very uh, interesting evolution and, 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 and moving quite quick. So to collect information, that's, uh, again, as a geographer, I want to know where these things are. Um, it needs to be connected to the, the global positioning system. And there's GNSS and, and all kinds of other systems. And more and more, this is another recent, fairly recent, um, you can basically have a, a real-time kinematic or a post-processing kinematic uh, GPS system integrated into your, um, 
your platform. And what that means is instead of, you know, errors of plus or minus a few meters, um, now you can get positional information down to, you know, centimeter scale. And this is pretty important because it's allowing us to uh, do away with the need for uh, laying out uh, ground control points. And I'll talk about ground control points in, in just a little bit. Um, the, and, and there are different systems that are providing these um, RTK or, or post-processing kinematic uh, systems out there. And some are integrated into the, the platforms themselves. So this EBX that we have, it has a, a RTK antenna in it. You just need a base station. Um, in addition to the GNSS, it's also uh, good to have a uh, inertial measurement unit. And so that basically has accelerometers that can do uh, very quick uh, corrections for pitch, roll, and yaw um, as it's going through turbulence. And so it's, it's an additional data stream to allow uh, precise information about navigation and trajectories um, and direct georeferencing, this idea about these GNSS inertial uh, systems. There's a recent paper that's come out uh, comparing these different methods and, uh, and versus the more traditional uh, use of uh, ground control points. Um, there is just a quick question, which one is better, RTK or PPK? So there's, those stand for, RTK stands for real time kinematic. And that basically means that in real time, you're getting um, a corrected uh, positional coordinates. There's a, usually a, a base system that you've set up on some occupied point that you know the coordinates of and then the drone is flying over and there's radio communication between the two and the base is transmitting in real time um, corrections to the drone. So every time, if it's doing a survey and it's flying, it's taking photos, each of those photos gets geotagged in real time um, with good coordinates. Post or PPK, uh, post-processing kinematic, means that um, you have a base station, the drone is also has its, its GPS receiver and it is collecting information, but it's, you're not going to get those, those corrected coordinates in real time. You have to do some, some post-processing in the laboratory afterwards, and then you'll get the corrected uh, values. Um, so that's kind of the difference between uh, these ones. But back to this paper, uh, this is sort of an interesting paper. Um, the traditional way, if you've got a drone which either doesn't have a GPS, at this point, most of them all do, or that your GPS of the drone is, is not that great, um, you can put out ground control points in the environment. And these are visible points, oftentimes they're X's, and I'll show some pictures from some of our work, that you have surveyed in with GPS or other equipment, the coordinates of those points. And those points are are visible in the photos that you take. And so you can use that information to basically correct um, the, 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 the photo project that you've collected when you generate an ortho mosaic or digital surface model, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So in this paper example, they compared just using four ground control points um, or nine ground control points or using this new um, PPK system where the, the drone has a, uh, a receiver uh, for this um, more accurate uh, GPS registration on it. And what they found was interesting. Um, so this is the top is the horizontal root mean square errors for point positions in meters. And then the table eight is the, the vertical. And the, the PPK values they got were quite good. Um, and this is actually what we, on the ballpark of what we normally get when we do our uh, ground control points, which we survey in with differential GPS. I don't understand why their GCP coordinates are so, I would say, not that great. Um, you know, 20 plus centimeters or, or 70 centimeters in the vertical, that's not good at all. Um, but it, it's interesting to see that the PPK uh, errors that they're getting are comparable to some of the ground control point errors that we get. And that the reason that's important is because laying out ground control is a lot of work. I mean, we do flights most of the, and if we really need to lock it down in three dimensions and we put ground control out. We spend a lot more time 
hiking out and laying down the ground control and dealing with all this and surveying it in than the actual flight itself. The flight itself might just take you know, 15 or 20 minutes or something, but hiking out there and laying down the, G, the, the ground control points, that's where a lot of the time uh, comes in. So if we can do away with having to deal with ground control points, well, that, that's, a, that's a big game changer. And the technology's now progressed to the point where, unfortunately for a, for a price, for a cost, um, we're getting to the point where you may not need ground control points anymore, which is a, a pretty big deal. Okay, so you're, uh, you have a setup, you have a mission, you wanna map something and you're out there and you're ready to go and you do a flight and you've covered a 10th of the area that you wanna fly and then you run out of batteries, right? This is, this is the nightmare, this is the terrible. So this is why in my lab, my lab is almost nothing but batteries, which is a hazard, but I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of batteries. And um, because if there's something happening, there's an eruption occurring and it's changing very quickly and you want to fly it and then fly it again and then fly it again, you need batteries to support you to do that. Not only batteries for the SUA system, but batteries for the laptop and power to recharge batteries. And so a lot of the field planning um, and logistics uh, come back to making sure you have enough uh, power to do what you need to do. And so that's just an important consideration. The platform might be $1,000, um, but with that, maybe it comes batteries for you know, two flights. And maybe that's enough for what you want to do, um, but oftentimes for the types of operations that we do, we fly a lot because we either want to cover large areas or we want to cover the same area, but again and again and again. And so if you have access to power in the field, you can recharge your batteries in the field. Um, but if you're on the Marshall Islands or some remote place or in the middle of a, a eruption, and oftentimes the power will be down, uh, you need to have either a bunch of batteries or a generator to recharge things. So these are just some logistical things to, uh, to consider. Um, battery technology is changing, um, but uh, LiPo batteries, lithium polymer batteries, um, right now are still quite, quite common. Um, they have replaced uh, largely uh, uh, gas-powered engines or nitro engines, although gas engines um, can often have longer uh, duration flights. Now, if you are a volcanologist interested in using SUAS for doing gas sampling, you probably don't want a, uh, a gas-powered engine because the exhaust uh, coming out of the RC aircraft engine might interfere with the gas measurements that you're making. And so one more reason to potentially be with a um, electric battery, electric uh, propulsion uh, system. Um, LiPo batteries uh, can be dangerous. So if they get shorted or through overuse, or if there's a malfunction and the cells get breached, um, they, can, uh, they can burn and have reactions. And so that's just an important uh, consideration to make. There's also a life cycle associated with these batteries. And there's only so many discharges that they're, that they're rated for. And they're also, it's not optimal to, to discharge them all the way. You want to, all, there's, there's sort of a minimum level at which you want to discharge them. Now, if it's an emergency and you'll crash unless you drain the battery a little bit to get back home, you're going to drain that battery. But know that you're likely doing damage to that battery and its performance is going to suffer in the, in the future. So uh, Nick Turner, uh, my past associate, made this slide. Know your battery, know your aircraft. Um, your flight times will vary by, by several factors. Uh, a big one is the wind. If it's a calm day versus a windy day, you're going to be able to fly a lot more on that calm day compared to the windy day, particularly if you're fighting against the wind all the time. Um, battery age, I just talked about, you know, discharge and, and batteries and the number of cycles and such. So if you've got old batteries, you're going to have reduced performance compared to brand new high performing batteries. I'm gonna admit some more folks that are late to join the party. Uh, elevation. 
Um, we do some work here on uh, Hawaii Island, not uh, volcanic work per se, or active, not active volcanic work, but up at the summit of Mauna Kea, um, and which is about 14,000 feet, sorry to use um, English units. Um, and our, our system performance up there is, is much uh, worse than when we're working down at sea level. Um, the air is thinner, the engines need to work, uh, the propellers need to work that much more because there's just less air pressure uh, to keep the aircraft aloft. And so your battery times are going to be um, compromised when you're flying at high uh, elevation. So if you're up in the Himalayas or other folks, uh, other places like this, um, something to be aware of. Yes, temperature. I saw someone uh, say a question about temperature. Temperature also plays a role. So if it's if it's quite cold, that will also uh, uh, cause your 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 flight um, durations to be to be shorter. So that some folks use or sell these these battery warmers. So if you're working in really cold conditions, you want to warm your batteries up um, before uh, before flying. And then the type of flying that you do. So even the greatest pilot um, is going to be less efficient than a, a computer programmed autonomous system, which is laid out the flight path that it's going to take to cover the area. And so if you're a manual pilot, you're going to be more inefficient. You're going to have more corrections. You're going to have to make more wiggles and jiggles in your flight lines. And as such, um, if you can fly autonomously, that's a more efficient way to do it. There are some situations where a manned uh, flight path and, and man control still makes sense. If it's a quickly changing situation and you're looking for breakouts in the lava flow or something, um, it may be better to be on a, on a, a manual flight operations. Um, but in general, if you're just trying to do straight up mapping, autonomous is the way to go because it's more uh, efficient. And then I also see here, uh, weather plays a major role. Yes, for sure. And that can, you know, wind is a, a portion a portion of that. Great, yeah, this is, um, so battery safety and just in general, you know, larger thinking about safety. Um, the batteries can explode and cause fires. Um, for a lot of these uh, new systems, there's, there's less, a chance for you to mess things up with the, the, the batteries because it's just a single battery that fits into a single charger. But you should always be attending the batteries when you're charging. Uh, accidents do happen. Um, this, was a, a, this was not an electric battery, but um, uh, gas powered. But your first priority always needs to be the safety of, of people. And you, you, can't, you can't ever forget that. The, getting the data is very exciting. And, but your, your first priority with these things needs to be the safety of people. Uh, they can certainly be dangerous um, in the hands of inexperienced or reckless operators or even experienced operators. Unexpected things can happen. Um, you need to understand limitations of your, your radio frequency range. So if you're dealing it with a you know, very uh, topographically intense um, location with lots of you know, hills blocking you, there's a lot of dense vegetation, there are buildings around. Um, all of these things can cause interference and, and have you lose, lose signal. And uh, a, a major concern is conflict with other aircraft. And the last thing anybody wants to have happen is to have a uh, SUAS um, uh, conflict with a helicopter or a man fixed wing and cause an accident. And so we all just need to be incredibly aware and careful and in good communication with folks uh, regarding these things. So, and in each of your own uh, community and country and state, there will most likely be regulations about, you know, how do you, how do you legally and safely uh, fly these? And that varies from country to country. Um, but it's the, the pilot's responsibility to follow those rules and licensing and everything else that's, that's needed. In the past, there have been issues where, you know, drones have, have uh, this is many years ago, um, and sort of shut down. Um, in the U.S., we've got, uh, you know, know before you fly, a lot of information about the, the regulations and such. In New Zealand, they've got their own. In other countries, the same kind of thing. 
for multi-copters in particular, I think a good sort of thing to just keep in your mind is that they are like flying lawnmowers and, and they can kill you. And so if you keep that in mind and are respectful of that, uh, you will, um, uh, hopefully everybody will come home safe as well as anybody who's a, who's a spectator. Um, so there's a lot more rules and regulations and safety concerns, but just, you know, this is like a flying lawnmower. Just keep that in mind and that can help everybody be safe. Uh, again, part of the SUAS system is the ground control station. So this is either a laptop or an iPad, or they can be much more elaborate for bigger systems. But this is basically on the ground um, where the pilot in command is, 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 is standing or, or the other folks are part of the flight team. Uh, that gives you information about the aircraft, its performance, where it is. If you have a real-time data link, you can see what the, the, the videos and cameras are seeing. And so this is a, uh, an important uh, consideration. And it can be as simple as just an iPad. It could be your, your, just your, your smartphone. Um, it might just be the, the controller itself. Um, but again, just like you need to think about power for the, the, the drone in the air, you need to think about power for the ground control station because it doesn't help you if you have plenty of uh, batteries to fly, but your controller or your, um, your ground control station has run out of battery power, right? And so that's the, in this lower picture, it's hooked up to the car battery, right? You, you do what you need to do to, to keep operating. And there are some things to think about when you set up, you know, where will you get the least amount of radio frequency interference? So if you can set up on a high point with good visibility, that's always better than if you're on a, on a, on a, on a low valley or something. And line of sight is key for this as well. Um, in um, most normal operations here in the, the US, um, it is very difficult to get beyond visual line of sight permission to fly. Um, there's certain exemptions to that. Um, and so positioning your ground control station in a place where you've got good line of sight is important because otherwise you're gonna have to set up in a new location, new location, new location, or you can a daisy chain with other observers distributed around. So there's ways around this, but basically the more area you can see, the easier your life will be. And again, how long are operations going to take? Um, so I had a question about the, the vehicle's battery. Yep, we basically had a, an inverter or a converter that, that took the DC into a, um, I think it was a 1200 watt inverter, and then we could plug our laptop directly into that, that inverter. But if you have a generator, uh, you can do the same kind of a thing. Or if you carry, you know, heavy batteries out to the, but again, if you, if you hike those things out, it's just, um, you want to think about, you want to think about the weight, because uh, hiking through the jungle carrying a, you know, marine battery, which we've done plenty of times, uh, it's a good workout. Uh, ground control stations, so there's a whole uh, flavor of different varieties. Um, they're open source, and then there's often proprietary platform specific. So eMotion is the system that gets used for uh, the, the EB family of aircraft. And I have one here, I'll show that in a little bit. But Mission Planner, open source, um, uh, a lot of uh, functionality, um, a great system that we use for some things. Pix4D Capture, again, not, I'm not endorsing any of these. I'm just sort of sharing that there's a lot of these uh, uh, different things out, out there. And it's a, an important part of the the, it's an important part to think about in terms of how are you going to use this piece of equipment and what do you need to do to accomplish what you want to do. So if you just want to take pretty pictures, you don't need any kind of sophisticated uh, mission planning mapping um, software. But if you want to do, you know, mapping and be able to set the amount of image overlap and other things, you're going to need a little bit more control. And, uh, and again, depending on the system, a lot of them have ground control or software that, that comes with them, or there's third parties that have written software to work with your, your equipment. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, sensors and, uh, and payload. <clears throat> so the, the three other sessions uh, for the summer school um, are going to be talking more in, in, in depth about um, thermal remote sensing, 
uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, SAR interferometry. So I hope you all stick around for, for those. Um, uh, but this is just a, an, in the, in the uh, sign up, I asked you some different questions and, and um, the vast majority of folks participating in this um, have said that they've at least at least taken some undergraduate remote sensing courses, if not graduate remote sensing courses. So I'm sure many of you have, have seen this, you know, again and again. But just the idea that um, there are these at atmospheric uh, transmission windows where you can get a lot of signal coming through and uh, the sensors uh, uh, take advantage of that. And it also depends on what you're interested in. Again, I do a lot of mapping, um, not so much uh, gas sampling, um, but the, the different sensors that you use are going to clearly, you're going to want them to be sensitive to what it is you're interested in. Um, this is an image uh, that we collected with a, a near infrared camera over the Pahoa lava flow. Um, and it's a false color image, so uh, vegetation in this case is appearing, uh, appearing red. I went into my uh, laboratory and I uh, just, um, let me admit another person here. <clears throat> and I uh, went ahead and just pulled out a number of different sensors that we have uh, in, the, in the lab. And these are, um, these are uh, ranging from you know, hyperspectral sensors uh, with custom gimbal mounts that we've uh, had built and designed uh, to multi-spectral sensors, um, to just straight up RGB cameras, um, and then th uh, thermal. And I actually have one of these thermal cameras here in my office as well, I can share in a bit. In general, the spatial resolution that you'll get from these different uh, sensors is going to be highest for the RGB cameras. And that's because they are coming out of hundreds of years of uh, commercial photography research and development. And so we're really good at making RGB cameras now. Like the, you know, modern civilization makes great RGB cameras because there's a big market for RGB cameras. Multispectral cameras, it's a much smaller market. Um, although it's growing. So agriculture applications for SUS and other ones are, are starting to see some, some big innovations in this area. But in general, the spatial resolution you'll get for a multispectral camera is much poorer than what you'll get for just a, a straight up RGB camera. And same for thermal. So the, the resolution for these thermal and, and multispectral and hyperspectral systems, the spatial resolution will be generally much worse than what you get for an RGB uh, camera. But you get that additional information from uh, other portions of electromagnetic spectrum, which can tell you things about mineralogy or if you're thinking about vegetation, vegetation health and other things that may be quite, quite valuable. So I'm just curious, and we're going to do another annotation if I can get this going here. I'd like you guys to, um, I'm going to allow you to annotate in a second here. Just go ahead and mark the, the one type of camera that you think would be most uh, valuable for the, 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 the work that you're interested in doing. So you should have annotation capability. And I'm seeing some hearts coming out. Interesting. And for those of you who um, don't see what you want on here in terms of LIDAR or uh, SAR, um, yes, those are, we actually have a ground-based LIDAR, but it's too big for me to put on a, on a drone. But I'm seeing, um, interestingly, a lot of uh, uh, hyperspectral uh, for the, the work that, that, that you all want to do. And that's fantastic because uh, tomorrow, um, uh, I think in session, uh, session three or four, um, but it's, um, 
uh, Fabrizia, she'll be speaking about both hyperspectral and thermal remote sensing uh, for, for uh, volcanic applications. So that should be uh, very uh, useful uh, uh, for you all. So, so that's great. Wow, I, I would not have thought that um, hyperspectral would have there had been so much interest in the in this in this community, but it, it seems that way. And it, it hasn't been getting too much love, but I will tell you that RGB. Um, Again, because of that very uh, fine spatial resolution, at least for the types of questions that I'm interested in, allows me to, uh, we, it, it's kind of our workhorse. We use that for, for, for many things. All right, so I'm gonna stop your ability to, to annotate and I'm gonna clear all the drawings. But thank you very much for that. That's quite, that's quite interesting. Yes, and there's some points here about hyperspectral that's expensive. And it, and it is quite expensive. And so, you know, that hyperspectral sensor, um, I can buy many, many other sensors just for that single hyperspectral sensor. And it's just good to think about anytime you put a, uh, a drone in the air, there's a, a possibility that you're going to have a failure. And this hyperspectral system costs many times more than the actual drone that's carrying it. And so you just need to be able to uh, be at peace <laughs> with that idea that you're putting a very expensive piece of equipment up in the air and it might fall out of the sky. Um, I'm getting some questions about uh, RGB. You can, there are some vegetation indices that you can derive from RGB, but not quite as powerful as what you can do with uh, multispectral or, or hyperspectral. Um, okay, very good. And, and then, yes, this idea about, um, uh, um, having multiple systems in, in one camera. These thermal cameras actually, um, they're fantastic. This is the X-T2 and it's both a thermal camera paired with an RGB camera. So you get two different data streams coming out of the, the single camera. And that's really, really great because instead of having to do two separate flights that we would in the past or having two birds in the air at the same time, um, you can just do with one flight, get these two uh, data streams. And so that's really um, been quite, quite useful and a, and a nice innovation. All right. Um, a, a few of you uh, were mentioning uh, LIDAR in, in some of the, the comments. And um, again, uh, LIDAR is a, another a very um, valuable uh, type of sensor. And primarily because of it is an is an active form of remote sensing. So with lidar, you are you're sending out um, laser pulses into the environment, and they have uh, so it's not just the photons from the sun that are bouncing off surfaces, but you're actually sending energy out. And because of that, lidar has more vegetation penetration ability or water penetration ability than you get if you're just using traditional RGB cameras or multi multispectral cameras. So in areas where you've got dense vegetation and you want to get at uh, bare earth surfaces, uh, LIDAR can be very, very helpful. If you're dealing with an unvegetated surface, like a lava flow, for example, um, there may not be as much benefit of using LIDAR relative to just simple photogrammetry with RGB images, um, particularly if you've got good either ground control points or, or georeferencing information um, you can get very highly accurate three-dimensional models simply from taking uh, photos over, you know, unvegetated areas. And, and so it depends what you're interested in. Um, if you really want to know about um, landscapes below vegetation, under vegetation, you may want to invest and think about LIDAR. If you're thinking about areas which are very sparse with vegetation, you can learn quite a bit. Um, just with uh, photogrammetry. And there's a number of good papers that have been published comparing LIDAR versus photogrammetry. And depending on the, the level of vegetation, uh, the three-dimensional models are uh, quite uh, comparable. And the cost of a RGB camera is quite a bit less than the cost of a LIDAR system. And if you crash, you're not gonna be as sad if it's just a, a 0.2 camera, for example. There's a lot of different LiDAR systems out there. Um, they're getting smaller and smaller, better and better. Uh, a lot of this is coming from autonomous cars, right? So autonomous cars have these LiDARs to make sure they don't hit pedestrians and things. And so the UAS community is benefiting from those technological advancements. So again, this is this interesting marriage of these different industries and, and how it's influencing. 
And there's other types of uh, uh, sensors and payloads uh, that uh, can be carried by a, a small unmanned aerial or small unoccupied aerial system. And so this is actually from the paper that I asked you all to, to read beforehand. And so this is um, figure 19 showing some instrument deployments uh, via um, some relatively large uh, UAS systems. But basically, it's a seismic observation module. Um, yeah, these are sort of seismic things that are going on. Uh, or this is a robot that is dropping off. Um, and so these, these larger UAS are more capable of carrying payloads. And it may be a gas analyzer, or it might be something that it's actually going to drop off and then retrieve uh, later. And uh, this is really important and a, and a fantastic um, a capability, particularly if you're working in a, in a dangerous, uh, unstable environment where it is not safe to send people out. And you really want to get the data from this location, but you'd put someone in, in harm's way uh, to put them out there. So instead, you just fly a drone and drop off the sensor, or fly a drone, which is carrying the sensor, and collect the data that you need. So to, to reduce the amount of risk to, to humans, um, uh, I think that's one of the greatest benefits of these systems. Not only to, to put sensors in, out in the environment, which might be dangerous, but just for mapping itself. So anytime uh, people go into a helicopter and do a flight, there's you know the, the possibility that something's going to go wrong. That, that same risk exists when a drone flies up in the air. But if the drone crashes, you lost your equipment, right? If the helicopter with four people crashes, it's terrible. So it, the more that we can reduce the amount of risk that we put people in harm's way, I think that these, these drones have a really good uh, possibility for Re reducing that risk to, to, to folks. Um, and, uh, and we're kind of focused on, I'm seeing some more comments about coral reef mapping and other things. Yes, fantastic. I'm, I'm more focusing on sort of uh, volcanic remote sensing applications um, for, for now. So, and a, and a great example of this uh, sensor deployment is a recent um, a mission done here in Hawaii by the US Geological uh, uh, Survey. And if I can get my screen sharing going, I'll, I'll play a video for you all. Um, so we're gonna do a new share of this one. And then I'm gonna play it and I'll be quiet for a bit. And uh, this is a really interesting video. I, I know the people involved. Uh, we did a little bit of preparatory work uh, to, to get them ready, but, but this is all the USGS is fantastic. Yeah, no, no sound. So let me try to um, make sure that we get sound capability. If I don't and it's quiet, I can, I can talk over it. But hopefully, I don't need to talk, and we can, we can get this guy going. Meeting controls. Share computer sound. Let's try this now. All right, let's try this again. I'll sort of move it back. Source of the water was a major unknown for us and a, a point for the sampling. Um, we saw the rise so steadily, uh, we deduced that it was groundwater um, coming in, but there's also an influence of magmatic degassing and rainwater as well. So we needed to collect a sample of the water so we can get a full picture of how much gas is actually being released from the magma below. Sulfur dioxide, or SO2, is a gas at volcanoes that can indicate how active the volcano is or how active it might become soon. So the more sulfur dioxide that comes out, we might be looking at more volcanic activity in the near future. Unfortunately, water dissolves sulfur dioxide, 
So now we're not getting accurate measurements of how much gas is coming from the deep magma because it's dissolving into our water lake. Um, leading up to the sampling, there was a lot of preparatory work that we had to do in cooperation with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and our pilot colleagues from um, mainland USGS offices. We had to make sure we had all of the sample bottles ready, the actual sampler, the UAS itself, and we had to make sure that everything could be accomplished safely. Our sampling team had decades of experience and was comprised of Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and other USGS scientists, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Department of Interior, Office of Aviation Services, pilots, and others. Well, we wanted to get an early jump on the day because uh, generally first light is about the uh, calmest weather conditions at the crater. So uh, we got out there at about six o'clock in the morning. We all met at the Jagger parking lot, which is a familiar spot for all of us. And we caravan down to the crater's rim where we set up operations for drone sampling. The sampling itself took place at about 9 a.m. So we had a little bit more wind to contend with than um, at the first light, but we were still able to, under favorable wind conditions, collect the sample. It was really exciting that morning. Um, there was a lot of reconnaissance that had to be done first. Our pilots who would be flying the mission had never actually seen the crater with the lake in it. So they had to make sure that they were comfortable with our launch site and uh, with the conditions in the crater. The initial flight was just um, with a camera and that was so the pilots could get a sense of what things looked like down there and how the winds affected the flying. It was the second flight of the day after the pilots had established that things were safe and they were comfortable with flying that's when we were going to get the water. So we attached the water sampler, the pilots made sure everything was okay with the drone end of things, and we, the HVO scientists, made sure the sampler was ready to go, and then it took off. It was a nerve-wracking moment getting ready for flight. We had put months of um, planning and logistics and writing permits into this, and it was finally time to go. So the drone pilot lifted off smoothly and rose up vertically in the air, and I stabilized the sampler so it wouldn't swing, and he took off, and it was all in his hands after that. So the, the sampling line and sampler itself consisted of 30 feet of polypropylene cord and a high-density polyethylene sampler attached to the bottom. It was necessary to attach the flagging so that the pilot, who is operating through a first-person viewer on a, on a laptop screen, could tell range down to the water level. So the flagging was attached at five-foot increments, um, at 5, 10, and 15 feet up from the bottom. So he was able to, in this case, uh, navigate in the vertical direction down into the water according to those sample flag tapes. So the sampling apparatus consisted of a sleeve of high-density polyethylene that when it is lowered into the water is squeezed shut and excludes all air. And then when it is pulled vertically, it traps water inside of it and um, at, a, at a given depth and is returned to the surface. The sample was collected at a depth of about eight or 10 feet below the surface of the pond. We sampled from that depth because we wanted to exclude any potentially diluted water at the very surface. We wanted to try to characterize the entire lake with one point sample, which is a tricky thing to do. So the reason the flagging tape looks like it was melted or, or otherwise compromised is because it just got wet and it clung to the uh, vertical cord. It was great to see the drone actually get the water and then come back up out of the lake and hover there with the water sample. But it was still nerve wracking because it still had to get back to us. So we just had to wait and hope that it made it all the way, that it wasn't too heavy or anything like that. It was really gratifying when uh, we actually had the water returned and in our hands on the ground. In some ways, the most tricky part of the sampling was handling the sample once it came back to us at the crater ram. Uh, the drone hovered and, and was able to locate the sampler right above our collection point on the blue tarp, and we stabilized it. The drone pilot released the sampling cord, and then we processed the sample down into um, sterile containers right on site. Splitting the sample on site turned out to be a little trickier than we anticipated because the apparatus involves a puncture with a straw, much like a juice pouch. And that was a little bit tricky to handle. We spilled a little bit of water. Things got a little messy, which was perfectly fine because we were prepared in advance with safety goggles, thick rubber gloves, and uh, safety smocks to make sure that if anything did spill, that we wouldn't be injured or burned or otherwise affected by the potentially very acidic water. We collected about 750 milliliters of lake water, which is about 
a bottle of wine's worth. Once we containerized the water, um, we had several other flights that day in order to characterize volcanic gas emissions in the crater, as well as collect more imagery. And uh, after we wrapped in the field, we brought it all back to the laboratory where we further split and um, filtered some of the aliquots for shipment and analyses at the California volcano. Okay, so that should give you a sense about um, how these folks, uh, oh, the sun's coming in, it's blinding me. Give me one second. I'm gonna... Sorry, we started this before sunrise and sunrise has just popped up. Um, but yes, that should give you an idea about some of the different applications um, for uh, what you can do with some of these larger, um, these larger, uh, these larger systems. So I'm actually going to um, get rid of my virtual background here. This is a, a photo I took from the Marshall Islands. It's not from Hawaii. Um, but I'm going to show you my more messy office and I've got some equipment here that we could maybe um, I can just show and if there's any questions about this or uh, anything else we've talked about so far um, I can address them and then we'll take a, a, a brief break and then we'll start into session two where I'll, I'll or not session two but the, the second part of session one where I'll communicate about some actual missions and, and lava mapping operations and eruption operations here in Hawaii. Um, so let me try to get rid of my, my background. All right, magically, I'm now off of the Marshall Islands and here in my office. And uh, just while I'm here, I've got a number of different, I'm gonna take my headphones off, I see you can hear me. Um, but this is the EBX. So this is a, a fixed wing platform that we uh, use for mapping. And um, again, here it is in real, real life. This is the, uh, uh, it's got the, the uh, post-processing kinematic uh, capability um, uh, for positioning. You can have a number of uh, uh, different, there's no sensor in here right now, but um, we've got a number of different sensors that can fit right in there. And, um, Again, one of the benefits for this is that it can fly for uh, 90 minutes. So it can fly for an hour and a half in optimal, in optimal conditions. Uh, we've actually never hit 90 minutes, um, but that is what is, is advertised. But it certainly can fly a lot longer than any of our uh, other equipment. Um, and so there are times when you want that, uh, that uh, endurance to either you know, map a larger area in one fell swoop or to you know, keep mapping the same area. You can basically kind of circle around an area and keep starting the mission again and again um, and see something that's changing uh, very uh, rapidly. But again, these cannot hover, right? So, and you need a place to land them. And so that's, that's a major concern and why this doesn't get used as much as it, as it should is because of our uh, concerns about safely landing um, this, this guy. This is um, one of the uh, thermal cameras that we have. Um, you'll see that this has got a number one on it. We actually have two of these because it's important to have um, redundancy. Uh, so I'll just open this up and uh, let you see this thing. So it's on a gimbal. And again, it's got, um, it's got these two, let's see if I can, yeah, but it's got these two sensors. So you get both the RGB and then a thermal uh, from the same flight. And when you were looking at the, um, the, the lava, uh, not the lava lake, but the, the crater lake video with the USGS that I just played, they were using, I, I presume this camera, because you saw on the inset, you know, what the thermal photo was versus, or video versus what the, the visible was. So um, we have uh, uh, two of these because um, the thermal information during an eruption is very uh, uh, valuable. And um, the 2018 eruption, which I'll talk about after the break, um, we uh, at that point had just one thermal camera and we were flying a lot. We were flying a lot. And, um, and the thermal, 
and the thermal camera only fit the Inspire 1, and we had a failure you know, during one of our uh, missions. Um, and it wasn't a user failure. It was basically an equipment malfunction when the batteries uh, failed. And this thing plummeted out of the sky and smashed our thermal camera. And so we lost our ability to do thermal mapping when this went down. Uh, luckily, at that point in the eruption, the USGS had, had come on scene uh, with their own drone team. And so they were able to pick up the slack for some of the thermal mapping. Um, but I just you know, share this with you all just because again, accidents and malfunctions and things do happen. And so if you have redundancy by having you know, multiple pieces of equipment, you're able to, to you know, that's a basic lesson from, from any kind of field work, but well, that's one that's worth. Uh, this is uh, the Ivan. This is from a company called Aerotestra. And uh, we use this for our RGB mapping. We also have a, a way to mount our hyperspectral camera into another one of these. Um, uh, this thing is a little bit um, overpowered. It's uh, kind of like an Italian sports car. It kind of breaks, but it's uh, very exciting. Let's see if I have any questions here so far. Oh, the the... The thermal camera that it's it's called the XT2, and that's um, sold by uh, a, a DJI. So it's the XT2, and it can fit on um, I, it can fit on the Matrice 200. I think it can fit on this new Matrice uh, 300. It can fit on the Matrice 600 with a, a correct mounting plate. Um, it can't fit on any of our older um, Matrice, uh, like the Inspire 2. Uh, this camera will not fit on the Inspire 2. For one thing, it's, it's pretty heavy. And so you need, you need additional sort of lift capability uh, for, for that. And then um, uh, this is another, if I can open it up properly. Um, <laughs> nah, this is the, this is the opening. Um, this is so this is a, a nice little backpack. It's super light and easy. Um, but in here we've got, you know, the iPad, and then we've got the controller, and then we've got, you know, this, right? So this is uh, this Mavic um, 2, just fits in your hand, right? And so again, if you need to hike into an area, um, you really would much prefer to hike in with this guy instead of any of this other stuff behind me that needs to be in a big protective case and you know just terrible to work with. These are the batteries, right? So, and this thing can fly for about half an hour or so, maybe a little bit less. Uh, it's got a pretty nice camera in it. Um, and I'm sure next year something even better will, will be on the market. Um, uh, but you know, the, the logistics of dealing with this as opposed to dealing with one of these, these larger uh, uh, birds are, are quite, quite a bit simpler. Um, so uh, if there are questions, um, I'm happy to uh, try to address any questions that, that come up. Um, and, um, and so please uh, feel free to, to, to type in any kind of a, a, a chat question if you might have. Um, and if there are not, that's okay. Um, what we're going to do is, okay, there's a question here. Which, which drone is your favorite and why? Um, so it, it, the, the, the true answer to this is it, 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 it depends on the, it depends on the mission. It depends on why we're going to fly, right? So if, if we are going to, so we just did a recent, um, flight to, we have these endangered birds here in Hawaii, the alala. It's a kind of a crow, and there's, they're doing a, a, a release of these birds into the wild. And they wanted us to help them, the researchers, to understand the quality of the nest and if they'd laid any eggs. Um, and so they were monitoring the birds. They knew the birds were far away from the nest at the time that we, fl we did the flight. And we actually used this little Mavic because it was very dense canopy to sort of pop up by the tree and look around and look in the nest and see if there were eggs or not there. So in, for that one, you know, this little guy was the best thing. But um, for most of our normal mapping runs that we do now, we use this Matrice 200 a lot. 
Um, it is a little bit weather resistant. It's not waterproof, but weather resistant. It rains a lot here in, in Hawaii. Um, and it, 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 it seems very reliable. But if we want to map very large areas, um, we'll use this EBX uh, to map larger areas when we've got you know, big areas to, uh, to land, big safe areas to land. Um, so um, there are, uh, so yeah, lots of questions are coming in here. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of them. If I can't get to all the questions, you can feel free to, to email me. Um, so uh, ground control points and slopes like volcanoes, um, that's a challenge, right? And that's where this direct georeferencing or a, a RTK or PPK system would come in most handy. Um, and so, but again, that's expensive. So you either have somebody scramble down there um, and lay out some kind of ground control and then survey it in, or you invest in, and, and you need surveying equipment, GPS equipment to do that accurately, um, or you invest in you know, a PPK system on your drone, or RTK PPK system on your drone, so you don't need that that ground control. But a bigger question is, you know, what is the, um, the geographic error that you can live with? And so if you can live with plus or minus a meter, because the phenomenon you're interested in are much larger than that, then who cares? You don't need all this fancy stuff. But if you're interested in sort of centimeter scale differences, then you need to invest in this, you know, more expensive and more uh, thorough RTK PPK systems or extensive uh, ground control points. Uh, the communication range, um, so it, it depends, um, and oftentimes you're, you're, you're limited more by the, the regulatory framework in terms of um, how far the laws will allow you to fly, at least that's how it is here in, in the U.S., in Hawaii, um, unless you're in a special situation, which I'll talk about in the next part. Um, but, for example, the Inspire to the range that we could comfortably get with that one, um, uh, two to three kilometers. Um, at that point, it's, it's, it's maybe getting too small to see with the unaided eye. Um, uh, for these newer ones, the range claims are much longer than that. But again, the, the regulations in terms of being able to see it um, often come into play more than the, the technical limitations of the, the platforms them, themselves. Um, there's a question here about uh, post-processing. So for generating ortho mosaics and um, uh, digital surface models and things, um, we in my lab happen to use PIX4D, PIX4D Mapper. Um, Agisoft is another one that lots of fo folks use. I know the USGS uses that, many other folks do. There's some open source ones as well, but we primarily use um, uh, PIX4D Mapper. And then we also use something called LAST tools L-A-S-T-O-O-L-S, -O -O -L -S, to do more in-depth processing of our, of our point clouds. And then we bring it into um, NV for remote sensing uh, software uh, or, uh, or ARC or GIS or, or QGIS for doing some uh, GIS work. Um, and then for our hyperspectral camera, there's some proprietary software that comes with that for doing some of the, some of the processing. Um, great. I, let's see. That, so, yep, people do put thermal cameras on these small little um, Mavics. Uh, they certainly do. Um, there are lots of different uh, communities for uh, sharing information. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the, 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 the one mapping, um, the, the mapping group that we, or the software that we, Mission Planner. So Mission Planner, Mission Planner, is an open source. Um, uh, that's a great. That's a great place if you're interested in open source kinds of kinds of things. Um, let's see a couple more questions, and then we're going to take a, a a quick a quick break. Um, so, uh, magnetic field effect on drones due to volcanic fluid um, uh, movement. Um, so we uh, have definitely had issues when we're uh, trying to, uh, with compass calibration, where the, the drone will, where we want to take off, the drone's compass gets all screwed up because of, I don't exactly know why, but maybe there's some uh, magnetic things going on. And so we need to change location until um, we're away from those strong magnetic fields and the drone's uh, compass is able to um, calibrate itself. Um, we have also, uh, when we first started flying, and I'll talk about this in part two, um, 
we were really concerned about you know updrafts associated with uh, lava flows if that turbulence would sort of you know cause problems for our our platforms um, because people in manned uh, helicopters who have fly over lava flows a lot have experienced this kind of a thing um, and we haven't really uh, ever had any issues with turbulence uh, ruining the mission or anything like that. I had some questions about working with a swarm of drones. Um, we uh, have not worked with hundreds of drones all at once, but we have worked with small handfuls of, uh, I think four in the air at the same time. And I'll, I'll, I'll share some information um, with, with that in, 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 in part two. Okay, I think, and, and there's a lot of questions here about some of the you know, setting emissivity on the thermal camera and such. I will, I will defer to the, um, the thermal experts who are coming in the additional sessions uh, to communicate about you know, thermal remote sensing. Um, so I'm gonna take a, we're gonna take a five minute, we're gonna take a five minute break. Let me, let me, let me bring this thing up here and um, let me see about my screen sharing. Share the screen. Great. So um, let's see. It is uh, here in Hawaii. It's 6.48 a.m. I'm not sure where it is for you all, but um, let's say, uh, let's, let's give everybody 12 minutes. So let's start back in, in, at the top of the hour. So whatever that means for you, but we're going to start back on the top of the hour. Okay. So I'll see you all in uh, approximately 12 minutes at the top of the hour. Um, fantastic. 